This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our oral medicine series. We mentioned smoking throughout this series during the COPD, asthma, and substance abuse videos, but I wanted to make a video dedicated to this topic of smoking because it is very important to know for the board exam. Tobacco use by cigarette smoking or by smokeless tobacco products is an addictive and harmful process. And even though the prevalence of smoking has generally declined over recent years, it continues to be a major public health concern. It's the leading cause of preventable death and disease in the United States. Smokers die on average 10 years earlier than non-smokers, and smoking is linked to a whole host of issues from cataracts to pneumonia, lung cancer, COPD, an exacerbation of asthma, cardiovascular disease, oral cancer, and acute myeloid leukemia, just to name a few. So nicotine is the primary addicting component of tobacco products, and it comes from the Nicotiana tobacco plant, which is pictured here. And this is the main commercial tobacco plant. Nicotine is contained within the leaves of this plant, which is harvested for making tobacco products. There's about one to two milligrams of nicotine per cigarette, and it rapidly distributes to the brain with drug levels peaking within about 10 seconds of inhalation. So you feel the effects almost immediately, and then they dissipate quickly afterward, compelling you to want to keep smoking to maintain the pleasure. Nicotine activates the endogenous reward system of the brain, primarily through dopamine circuits. And this is the same exact mechanism of action for other addicting drugs like opioids, alcohol, and cocaine, like we talked about in our substance abuse video. Nicotine use increases the levels of dopamine in the reward circuits. So then the brain craves more of that dopamine, which is satisfied by more nicotine use. And so the cycle continues. Nicotine also stimulates the adrenal glands to release epinephrine, which causes an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration rate. Most people who try to quit smoking on their own will experience relapse, usually within the first week of quitting. Why is that? Well, it's due to the body's dependence on nicotine, and when you take that away, the body experiences some nasty withdrawal symptoms. Physical symptoms include irritability, craving, depression, anxiety, cognitive and attention deficits, disturbed sleep, and increased appetite. These symptoms may begin as soon as a few hours after the last cigarette. They usually peak within the first few days and then subside after a few weeks. So let's go through a couple of the different tobacco products out there. Cigarettes contain finely chopped tobacco leaves wrapped in some non-tobacco paper. A cigarette might contain menthol, tar, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde, as well as a whole bunch of other chemicals, many of which are very harmful and carcinogenic chemicals. Not all cigarettes have menthol in them, but I wanted to mention it because it's a flavoring that masks the harsh taste of cigarette smoke. And the FDA is currently trying to ban menthol and other flavors to make cigarettes overall less appealing. Secondhand smoke, which refers to the smoke that is breathed in by someone not actively doing the smoking, has the same adverse health effects because that smoke is going to contain all of the same harmful chemicals like carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. There are some size variants to the conventional cigarettes. A cigar is larger, and it's wrapped in tobacco, so it could be actual tobacco leaves or paper that's fabricated from tobacco. And then a cigarillo is a smaller version that's also wrapped in tobacco. So next are the pipes. A conventional pipe is a bowl that contains loose leaf tobacco smoked in here. The traditional pipe, this would be the traditional pipe that you see people in movies use, like Sherlock Holmes, for example. Hookah refers to a water pipe containing shredded tobacco leaves with fruit, spice, or candy flavors. And hookah might taste better, 
but all of the adverse health effects are the same. In fact, every puff of hookah smoke has the same amount of nicotine that's in an entire cigarette. So that's one to two milligrams of nicotine per puff. Next up are the smokeless tobacco products. This includes oral snuff, which is finely ground tobacco. Users take a pinch of powder and typically place it between their buccal mucosa and gingiva for about 30 minutes. And the location where they place it is important, as we'll discuss later. Chaw is chewing tobacco composed of coarsely shredded tobacco leaves, which would be chewed against the buccal mucosa. And snus originated from Sweden, and it's a tea bag like pouch that contains tobacco powder, and you'd also hold it in your lip. And lastly are the electronic nicotine delivery systems. So for these devices, a liquid is heated by an electric current into an aerosol or vapor that the user inhales, hence the term vaping instead of smoking. Some examples of these are e-cigarettes or electronic cigarettes. They basically look like a cigarette, but they just function differently. And the vape pen, which is shown here, is about the size of a pen, and it produces that vapor that I talked about. While the e-liquid that's contained in these devices does not contain tobacco leaves, it still contains nicotine, as well as a whole bunch of other harmful chemicals, particularly diacetyl, is very harmful, which has been shown to cause popcorn lung, which refers to scarring of lung tissue. People used to think that chronic smokers should wean off of cigarette use by using an e-cigarette. They thought, well, if the e-cigarette's not as harmful, you still have to go through the motions of picking it up, putting it in your mouth, and inhaling, and so maybe that would be a way to wean them off of the more harmful tobacco smoking. Well, it turns out that's not really the case. The problem is, you still have a bunch of harmful chemicals like diacetyl, and recent studies showed that smokers who used e-cigarettes were actually at increased risk of not being able to quit. So the whole process basically backfired. There's not enough data about oral adverse effects of vaping compared to smoking. Now some say they're just as bad, others say they're less harmful to our oral health, so we'll have to wait and see for that. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of people want to quit smoking, but it's very difficult due to the physiologic dependence that people develop toward tobacco products. Counseling and medication can be used separately, but a combination of the two is most effective. So counseling via individual or group support has been shown to improve success. Practical counseling focuses on problem solving and skills training, while cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on managing your withdrawal symptoms, cravings, and tempting situations. Counseling over the phone, hypnotherapy, and acupuncture have all shown some evidence of efficacy as well. According to the CDC, tobacco cessation medications are deemed appropriate for most adult smokers, except pregnant women light smokers who smoke less than 10 cigarettes or a half pack per day, and people with epilepsy. Otherwise, these medications might help adult smokers to quit. Nicotine replacement therapy can take many different forms. You can find it as a patch, like Nicoderm, or a nicotine spray, like this Quick Mist. And the nicotine in these products mimics the action of acetylcholine at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, attempting to replace that craving of smoking or vaping, because you're agonizing that receptor, which usually gets agonized with smoking. Bupropione is an antidepressant that blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. So the patient should take it while they're still smoking, and then they should pick a quit day about one week after starting the bupropion because that's about how long it takes to reach steady levels in the blood. Vareniclin is a partial agonist of that nicotinic receptor. Similarly, you would take it while smoking and then set your day for quitting about one week out. And just an interesting side note, no tobacco cessation products have earned the ADA seal of acceptance. So, what do we do for our patients who are smokers? 
Well, since tobacco use has many oral health implications, which we'll go over in the next slide, dental professionals have a unique opportunity to step into the conversation around smoking prevention and cessation. And the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the DHHS, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the AHRQ, have published a five-step algorithm for healthcare professionals to use when engaging patients who are dependent on nicotine, and they call it the five A's. So the five steps here are to ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. So we would ask every patient about tobacco use and document it at every visit. So how much are they smoking? When did they start? Are there certain situations where they smoke more or less? Things like that. Then we would advise in a clear, strong, and personalized manner that a tobacco user should quit their habit. We would assess, is the tobacco user willing to attempt quitting at this time, or is that just not an option? For the patient willing to make a quit attempt, we would use counseling or pharmacotherapy, or preferably a combination of both, to help them quit their habit. And then we would finally arrange a follow-up schedule with the patient, either in person or over the phone, preferably within the first week after the quit date to check in on them and see how they're doing. All right, and perhaps the most important part of this video, the oral manifestations of tobacco smoking. So let's go through this list of oral pathology conditions and how they present in the mouth. Leukoplakia is this irremovable white plaque and it's a precursor for cancer. So tobacco smoking is a carcinogenic activity and it can cause cancer. And the most commonly caused cancer by smoking is squamous cell carcinoma. So both tobacco smoke and smokeless tobacco are carcinogens, which means they can cause cancer. But interestingly, nicotine specifically is not a carcinogen. So nicotine, which is contained within the tobacco leaves, not a carcinogen, but the tobacco smoke and smokeless tobacco products as a whole are considered carcinogens. Just wanted to clarify that. Nicotinic stomatitis refers to this whitish palate with some red dots that are inflamed salivary gland openings, and it's most commonly found in pipe users and in reverse smokers. So people who put the smoked end of the cigarette in their mouth. Smoker's melanosis refers to this brownish discoloration of oral mucosa. It's a little bit subtle there, but you can see it um, in parts of the palatal vault. Hairy tongue refers to this dark staining of the filiform papilla. Halitosis, bad breath, kind of explains itself why we would expect that in a smoker. Smokeless tobacco keratosis. So I alluded to this before. This is a white patch where the chewing tobacco product is held. So really any of those smokeless tobacco products we talked about, snuff, chaw, or snus, if it was contained within the vestibule, for example, you would begin to see this white patch with a corrugated appearance. And then periodontal disease is also evident in smokers. So you can see some gingival recession here associated with snuff use, but also periodontal health in general is negatively affected by smoking. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.